their approval falls through my fingers like sand. The trophies gather dust. Silence is all that remains. A violent cycle, all for what? All for them? There is one, one who burns down the ships and makes beauty from ashes. One who breaks all chains, one who heals all hearts. It is all for one. All for one. We've been in this series for several weeks now asking the question, who do we live for? Who motivates our life the most? Who is that audience that we live for? Because the bottom line is that we, in life, we all like to be liked and we like to be appreciated. And and sometimes we do things to be noticed, to get approval, for attention, for affirmation. That all plays into this. All for one. And it's hard as we go through life because we're trying to please different people at different times. And in life, something as simple as a, as a new haircut can change the way we feel about ourselves based on how others respond to us. Sporting a, a new hairstyle can bring words of affirmation. Like, I, I like your new haircut. Or, hey, it looks good on you. Or, I really like the new look. The new style fits you. All these words can can make you feel good on the inside. Now, I wouldn't know a whole lot about that. (laughs) What's so funny? (laughs) Follically challenged as I am, I, I can't change my hairstyle. I can't be in a mood and say, I just want something totally different. But I can change my facial hair. I mean, it is limited, but that's basically my option, changing the look of my facial hair. And, and this, this goatee, I, I like it at times, and I shave it off at times. And one day I, I was growing it out not long ago, and I, I was kind of tired of the, the gray look. And so I went to the store, and I was looking at colors to change it. I didn't want to go black or, or brown. That, that was just too normal. So I was looking at the more colorful colors. I'm really embarrassed to say this. I don't know why I'm saying this. But I started looking and there was green and there was yellow and there was orange and there was red and there was blue. And so I started looking at the colors and I thought, hmm, you know, my eyes are blue. (laughs) And so if, if I put, if I made this goatee blue, it would make my eyes pop, right? And so I grab the thing and I take it home and I go in the bathroom. I sneak it kind of by my wife. I go in the bathroom and I'm in there kind of brushing it down and I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm getting it all filled in and it's kind of doing its thing. It's setting in. And, I, and then I finally glance up at the mirror. And when I do, two words come immediately to my mind. Papa Smurf. <laughs> you, some of you were thinking that already, weren't you? And so I did change my hairstyle that day. I uh, shaved it all off. I didn't even leave the bathroom to show it to my wife. It's so easy to make changes in our lives based on what we think others are thinking about us or how we're perceived. And during this teaching series, we have been reminded of who we should all ultimately, ultimately be pleasing as we live our lives on this planet that all that we do should be done for the glory, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so today, as we continue in this series, All for One, our topic is walking in God's presence. If God is ultimately the one we're seeking to live for, one of the most important things that we must understand and put into practice is in our lives, walking in God's presence every day. And understanding that term, walking in God's presence, it's it's a little bit difficult in itself. And so I want to give you a definition of what I mean today when I'm speaking of walking in God's presence. And here it is. Walking in God's presence 
your walking in God's presence when living your everyday life draws you to Jesus because you're constantly aware of the active presence of Christ in your life. Now let's go back and look at that again. You catch all that it's saying? When living your everyday life draws you to Jesus because you're constantly aware of the active presence of Christ in your life. This is, not, this is not automatic in any of our lives. If we're honest with ourselves, we really can struggle at times with our Christian lives outside of this building, our everyday lives. It can be a struggle recognizing Christ's presence in our lives daily. One Christ follower described it this way, they said, I had, I had a deep desire to get closer to God. I put my faith in Jesus Christ as a young person, and I knew that God loved me, but I longed to experience him in my day-to-day life. Do you feel that longing at times to experience God's presence all day, every day, not, not, not just during church, not just during small group Bible study, not, gr- not, doing, or not just during time alone with God, but all day, every day. Pastor John MacArthur writes in his book, Alone with God, he writes, the fact is every believer must be continually in the presence of God, constantly breathing in his truths to be fully functional to be fully functional. I believe this to be true. To be fully functional, we need to understand and put into practice walking in God's presence every day. And so as we look at this topic today, I wanna cover three areas in our time together. I wanna talk about the promise, what Jesus says about his presence. I wanna talk about the problems that we encounter and and things that confuse us about God's presence. And I wanna talk a bit about the practice. How do we practically walk in God's presence? And so let's start with the promise. Our main passage today is found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. You can turn there, but it'll be on the screen as well. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is very familiar passage of scripture. A lot of times we call it the Great Commission passage, and there's a lot there. I want to to read it. Jesus came, told his disciples this, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. This passage records the very last words of Jesus before he left his disciples. He could have said anything in these last words that he spoke, but knowing they were his last words, Uh, puts a little bit of richness into them. These are the words he chose. They were powerful. They were life-giving. They were purposeful words that you and I have Christ's authority as believers to share the gospel, to mentor and disciple others, to baptize those who come to Jesus, to teach Christ's teachings. And then the very last words, and be sure of this, he says, Be sure of this, meaning of all you've seen and heard from me, what I'm about to end with is critical. These were the very last words. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so many times as we read this passage, we read so quickly over this verse and and can easily focus on all the good stuff that's there. And there's a lot. And sometimes as we read these final words, the very last few words, we just read them in passing. But Jesus chose to close out his conversation with his disciples with a promise. I will be spiritually present with you always. 
And we see it coming true if we continue reading in the Bible. In Acts chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit coming um, to the disciples, entering into their lives. This is Matthew 28 we're looking at. If we look at the very beginning of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, we read about Emmanuel, God with us. And then then we read Matthew 28, and we read that God, Jesus promises to be with us. Bookends to this book of the Bible, this letter. And we read this passage and we do get stuck so many times on all the other stuff there. And again, there's, all, there's, all, there's just so, such rich uh, wording and promises throughout. But there's something incredibly rich going on here that we can't miss, even though it's so easily done. Because it describes the miraculous gift that God has given us with his presence. You see, more than 2,000 years ago, a significant event happened. And because of this event, everything changed. Our relationship with God would never, ever be the same. Our lives today are not the same. Our families today are not the same. Our churches today are not the same. Our time on this planet is not the same because of this significant event that happened more than 2,000 years ago. And the event I'm speaking of, it it may not be the event you're thinking of. You see, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus hung and suffered and died on the cross outside of Jerusalem, Inside of Jerusalem, inside the temple, something else was happening. And that something else would symbolize an incredible change. As as soon as Jesus breathed his last, in that instant, there was a, a tearing, a ripping of a large piece of cloth that hung in the temple. That cloth that separated the most holiest of places We read about it in Matthew chapter 27. It says, Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain or the veil of the temple in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And although we read this and say that's kind of cool or whatever, this is nothing short of miraculous. The symbolism that God gives us here. Because when you realize that for thousands and thousands of years, from Leviticus through the Old Testament and into the New Testament, there was only one place where you could know where to find God's presence. And it was in the tabernacle or in the temple. That one place. And it wasn't available for 99.9999% of the people. For all these years, thousands and thousands of years, the people of God had been denied any direct access to God's divine presence. And only one person, the high priest, one time a year had the honor of the audience with the almighty God. But by his death, Jesus removed the barrier and opened that way to God. And this was symbolized by that tearing of the temple curtain or the veil of the temple. The barrier had gone and the way was open to God forever. And so in this passage that we looked at in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus was giving us an incredible gift, a promise. And it was a huge paradigm shift. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you now have that presence of God in you. We're taught directly about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, when it says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? This is huge. It, it, it's hard for us to realize the magnitude of this today because you and I, we have never known a time when only one man once a year 
could enter into God's presence. And that was it. None, none of the rest of us could. God's presence was not available to us. And so let us not uh, downplay what Jesus is saying here. These powerful words, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's our promise. And we must realize the incredible gift that we've been given to have the presence of God, his spirit in us and with us as followers of Christ. That's the promise. Now, let's look at some problems. Sometimes there's things that keep us from walking in God's presence or realizing that we are. The problems. Um, the, the first one I want to call false categories. False categories. And what I mean by that is that we have created in our minds and in our hearts false categories of spiritual and secular we can easily be fooled into believing that our lives are, are compartmentalized into spiritual and not spiritual or secular. One person was describing it this way. They wrote, it's a long way from Sunday to Monday. Sunday, we study scriptures, we talk and sing about Jesus and enjoy the warm Christian fellowship. But Monday, it's back to the grind. If only we could bottle up some of that Sunday blessing and make it last throughout the week. If only our church life could invade our daily life. If we could just bring these two worlds together. And my question is, but are there really two worlds? I don't think there are two worlds. I don't think that when Jesus was on this planet and he was spending time with the disciples, that there was a time when they're traveling together and then they sit down together and all of a sudden they're going to eat uh, together. And, and Jesus would say, uh, hold on a minute. Um, don't write anything down from this point on. I'm just going to eat. Um, this is not spiritual time, okay? It's, it's separated. I mean, I'll see Jesus saying that. When he was on the boat with the disciples and the storm was about to come, I don't see Jesus saying, well, um, you know what? I'm going to take a nap, so I'm going to clock out of the spiritual clock here. And uh, now I'll clock back in if there's some spiritual activity needed. There's this spiritual and secular mentality that we have about our lives. And it's so easy to think we walk into this building and it's spiritual time. And we walk out of this building and for some reason it doesn't feel as spiritual. But, but the God who walked in here with you walks out with you and goes with you wherever you go. And so there's not this separation. My wife bought me a, a book a while, a while back. It was entitled um, Every Moment Holy. And it's a very interesting book. I've never seen a book like it because it's just a book full, uh, filled with prayers. And it's prayers that, to, that you would pray while performing tasks throughout your day. And so if you flip through it, you'll find, and these are actual page prayers, you'll find a prayer for doing laundry. You'll find a prayer for cooking a meal or washing windows or home repairs You'll find a prayer for car repairs, which I usually pray when I'm trying to have a car repair and work on it myself. There's also a page and a prayer for changing diapers. I don't know if that's holy. Um, that may be the only thing that's not. <laughs> but it's so interesting, the mentality of the book. And in, in the forward of this book, there's a, there's a forward written by musician Andrew Peterson, and he writes this. He says, there are no unsacred moments. There are only sacred moments and moments we have forgotten are sacred. If that's true, then it is our duty to reclaim the sacredness of our lives. And I think he's right on with that. As followers of Christ, our lives are spiritual because the Holy Spirit is in us. Even though we live in a secular world. C.S. Lewis writes about this. He's, he writes, we may, we may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. 
The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. It's right. So so what I'm saying is that we must realize that God is in the mountaintop mountaintop experiences that we have, but he's also in the mundane. And when we separate those two, we are doing a disservice to understanding and living out walking in God's presence. False categories. There's also false beliefs. Things that we generally believe or sometimes say that aren't necessarily true. If we're not careful, we can be confused by this building that we're in, that we call a church. Because sometimes we can say, we can come into church and say, Lord, we've come into your presence today. And when we leave, we feel like we've left the presence of God. But the truth is, as a Christ follower, you don't come into God's presence at all, but you carry that active presence of God wherever you go. This is because we are the temple of the living God. His Holy Spirit dwells in us if we choose to be followers of Christ. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. This is just a building. He wasn't here waiting on us. And he's not going to be here all week long waiting for us to come back. Uh, Another one I want to mention is a verse found in Matthew 18, 20 reminds me of something. The verse itself is probably a familiar one. But before I read it, let me just say Matthew 18, where this verse is found, is a chapter of dealing with uh, church discipline and dealing with uh, when we have someone in our lives who's living in sin and we want to challenge them to make good decisions, not bad, and you know how to, how to go about that. And so you go, it tells you, you go by yourself and you talk to them, and if they don't respond, you take someone with you, and so on and so on. The whole chapter is about that. And right in the middle of all this is a verse that we use a lot, but we use it out of context. And this is the verse. It says, where, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. And if we're not careful, we will communicate that we have to have a certain number of people together before God shows up. We don't believe that. Bible doesn't teach that. God doesn't go, oh, oh, you have three people over here? Okay, hang on, I'll be right over. He's not waiting for a, a critical number to arrive. He is there with one follower of Christ. Now, there is a difference because there's momentum, there's energy, there's fellowship that happens when two or three or more are gathered. We understand that. But there's not an extra special dose of God's presence. The Bible doesn't teach that. And if the general thought of, of, of this if, if, we've, if we let this kind of live out in our lives throughout the week, then we can feel like that when we gather in this place, God's here because there's two or three or more, but when we're out at work and, and we don't know any other Christians around, we feel like there's something missing. It's not. It's the same God. A couple of, of problems. And let's finish with, the practice of this walking in God's spirit. So practically, what are some things we can do to help us constantly be aware of that active presence of Christ in our lives? The first is this, and and many of you know it already, to remember to have a daily focused time with God. Jesus took time to pull away Uh, from the busyness of life to spend time with the Father. And he models that for us. And we need to do the same. And so we are challenged to, to open up our Bible, to read our Bibles every day, to, to take a few short minutes to read through it. And based on if that's something brand new to you, you may just take five or 10 minutes. If it's something you've done for a while, it may be longer for you. But to read that Bible to interact with what it says. Sometimes we throw around those those three words, know, feel, and do. 
that we ask after reading something in our Bible, God, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to feel? And what do you want me to do because of what I've read? To interact with that and then spend some time in prayer, talking with God, finishing out our focused time. It's crucial, it's critical in our lives to spend time with God every day. It's going to, uh, that focused time with God is going to set our minds in the right place of helping us constantly be aware of the active presence of Christ. But I want to think outside of that. I want to think a bit more. Because so many of us know what it's like to, to read our Bibles, to, to pray, to have that focused time with God, but we still struggle with walking in God's presence the rest of our day. And so let me, let me suggest a couple other things. Not only remember to have a, that focused time with God, but to reflect with silence. You and I have got to find a way to silence this, this loud and busy world that we live in. The scripture reminds us when God says, be still and know that I am God. And so whether that's turning off the music in our car or pulling away from friends and family for just a few short minutes, there's nothing quite like the silence to remind you of God's active presence in your life. Peter Scazzaro in his book, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, he writes this about this topic. He says, our internal and external worlds are filled with noise and distractions. For this reason, spending time alone with God in silence is perhaps the most challenging and least experienced spiritual practice among Christians today. However, he says, that doesn't justify taking a pass. If we fail to learn how to be quiet in God's presence, to stop talking long enough and routinely enough to listen, how will we mature into Christian adults? How will our relationship with God develop any depth without silence? He's right. Is silence part of your day in any way? Silence. For, God, for God's still small voice to have a word with you. To reflect in silence. I think another thing is to recognize our feelings. You see, we are, we are emotional creatures. And we feel things on the inside throughout our day. But many times we don't share those things in our relationship with God. We don't talk to God about how we're feeling many times. But we see it in the Bible. We see Job uh, ranting on about his life. We, we see Jeremiah's depression and the depth of that. We, sees, we see Moses' anguish in the wilderness struggling and David's raw emotions throughout all of Psalms. And, and all these express their emotions without shame, without fear, without reservation in their relationship with God. And so why do we feel unwelcome to talk to God, to God about anger in our lives or frustration or depression or jealousy? Why is it that if we're feeling joyful, it seems so much easier to talk to God? Why is it that we feel it's more godly to suppress our feelings, especially the negative ones, than to feel them or talk to God about them? Our challenge in our lives is to share our feelings and let, let God work in those, to, to feel our feelings and let God deal with our feelings. Now, now please understand, I'm not referring to living by our feelings the scripture is clear in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 that we walk by faith and not by sight. And sometimes we mistakenly think that since we should walk by faith, not our feelings, that then we shouldn't have feelings or share feelings or connect those feelings to our relationship with God. 
the same author continues in his writing and he finishes with this. He says, I too was taught not to do feelings, especially anger, sadness, and fear. I rarely looked at the inner chaos that was my thoughts and my feelings. I sincerely believed it was more godly to suppress my feelings and set my mind on things above. Sadly, our failure, failure to recognize what is going on in our interior worlds causes us, this is what he writes, that causes us to miss many gifts from God as he wants to work in our lives, in what we're feeling, in what we're experiencing. He wants to show up in those areas. Many times we won't let him. to recognize our feelings. And then finally, to finish up, to resolve to never stop prayer or praying. You see, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17, it says, always be joyful and never stop praying. Maybe you're familiar with this verse. And obviously this scripture isn't telling us to drop every responsibility in life and just stand around all day praying. That'd be ridiculous. Sometimes in our normal day-to-day, -day, compared to what we might hear on Sunday mornings, we might think that our prayers aren't long enough or, or eloquent enough or spiritual enough. And so we just don't pray because it doesn't sound like it does on Sunday morning or from this stage. But never stop praying means that if, if prayer is calling on God, then calling on God in the morning during our, our, our focused time with him, we call on God in the morning and we don't hang up. The line is open. And maybe that for you, that means to start praying in short sentences and not focus on a prayer time, but to pray in short sentences throughout the day, like a sentence in the car, when you get in the car, a, a sentence when you first get up in the morning and get out of bed, a sentence walking into the office, a sentence when we first take our first sip of coffee. That's a pretty easy one for me to pray for, be thankful for. How about every time we pick up our phone and we look at the screen, we take 15 to 30 seconds and pray for something or someone that needs prayer. I think if we did that, we'd have a lot of prayer warriors around, wouldn't we? Truth is that it is possible to never stop praying, as the scripture says. And it's possible without making any significant changes to our schedule or time commitments. It's all about shifting our thought process and turning everyday moments into prayer. Pastor John MacArthur writes, he says, when Paul commands us to never stop praying, he doesn't expect us to walk around with closed eyes all the time, nor does he mean every prayer should last an hour or more. What he does mean however, is that we should be in constant connection or communion with God, no matter what we're doing throughout the day. And so let us remember to have this focused time with God and to reflect in silence sometime during the day, to recognize our feelings when, they, when they're there and present in our lives and talk to God about them and resolve to never stop praying some practical ways to walk in God's presence. You see, every day when you and I wake up, there is a connection. And that connection is already active. And that connection stays connected all day long, 24-7. And because we are aware of this connection, it changes things. Because we spend so much time with this connection, this connection changes the, the way that we live, the way that we work, the way that we spend time with our family, the way that we spend money, the way that we relax, ask for help, get direction. Uh, it changes the way we feel about other people. That connection is so very important to just about all of us in this room. But unfortunately, for many of us, this connection as I just described, isn't 
a connection to God's presence. It's a connection to our cell phone. I mean, think about what I just said. Every day when you wake up, that connection's already active and it stays connected all day, 24 seven. And because of this connection, things change. The way we live, the way we work, the way we spend time with our family or lack thereof, or the way we spend money, the way we relax, get directions. Why is that true of a gadget in our pocket or purse, but not true of the God of the universe? This God of the universe who gave his only son, who tore the veil of the temple from top to bottom to invite us to connect with him in a way that wasn't possible for thousands and thousands of years. He now lets us walk in his presence and connect with him. Will you connect with God's presence? Will you walk daily in his presence, because it will make all the difference. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the reality of what you have done for us, that you allow us to connect with you that you live in us as, as followers of Christ. You, you live in us and we have access to communication back and forth all day, every day. And our lives are forever changed. It's sad to think that we're aware of the connection of a gadget more than we are of you. What a brighter world this world would be, shining for Jesus if we walked in your presence daily, not just in this room where it's easy to do, but out there. Thank you for the gift of your presence. We love you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.